Hello, Prime members. You can listen to British Scandal one week early and ad-free on Amazon Music or via the Wondery Plus subscription on the Wondery app or Apple Podcasts. This episode contains strong language and also contains references to drug use. Please see the episode description for information about support services. Right, Alice, ready to start? <coughs> <coughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, God, are you OK? Actually, no, I I don't know if I can do it today. You sound awful. Yeah, I've got a head a cold and stomach. Oh, God. Bug. Yeah, yeah, both. Yeah, throat. Um, bags. Well, what what do you think we should do? I don't I'd probably cancel. Okay. Well, um, okay. I mean, it's not ideal, obviously, because we've got the studio books and everything. But yeah. If... <laughs> Whoa. Yeah, it's bad. Okay. Well, I think maybe you should just go home and rest. Probably just gonna get some kip. Okay. See ya. See ya, mate. Well, it's just me doing this one, folks. Um, I can see her out in the street now. She's got. Oh no. She's getting into a Ferrari with Jason Orange. Why is she wearing a little necktie? 3rd of July 1969. 12.30am. Cotchford Farm, Sussex. Anna Volin stands barefoot and dripping on the side of the pool. Next to her, Frank their builder gazes on as two paramedics perform CPR on Brian. She looks at Brian's limp body. His skin already has a pallor that makes her shudder. The paramedics finally sit up, shaking their heads at each other. Anna's legs buckle from under her. Don't stop! Please don't stop! This can't be happening, she thinks. This can't be. Brian's 27, healthier than he's been in years. Off the drugs, slowing down with the booze. And he's happy full of plans of putting together a new band. There's even talk of him collaborating with John Lennon. An uneasy feeling sits in the pit of her stomach. Something about this is off. All of a sudden, a police officer is dragging her to her feet. The policeman fires question after question at her. About Brian's mental state, how much he'd had to drink, the evening. Anna bats them all away angrily. He's not a junkie anymore, if that's what you mean. He's only on prescription pills now. He was happy, positive. He finally made up his mind to... Anna trails off as the farmhouse door swings open and the doorway is filled by Frank Thorogood's broad shoulders. He slinks over to the sink and begins pouring himself a glass of water. But she knows he's here to watch. Listen. Anna trails off. The uneasy feeling in Anna's stomach begins to swell. Something about Frank's leering manner has always made Anna shudder. He's been working on the house for nearly a year and even installed himself in a flat above Brian's garage. He spent a lot of time drinking, partying and bringing back women. But he's completed next to no work. Can you imagine if your builder did that? Still be faster than some of the ones I've ever <laughs> I knew you were going to say that. Great. Now we've lost all the builders that listen. You're going demo by demo by demo, week by week. She murmurs to the police officer that she wants to talk elsewhere. In the hall, she leans in close to the young police officer and whispers, I have a feeling Brian was going to fire Frank tonight. Her eyes nervously flip from the officer to the kitchen door. But the more the words pour out of her, the more she becomes convinced that they're true. I think Frank did something to Brian. Wondery's new podcast, Dis and Tell, wades into the glorious mess of celebrity beef. Each episode explores a different iconic celebrity feud and asks, what does our obsession with these feuds say about us? Follow Dis and Tell wherever you get your podcasts. You can listen ad-free on the Amazon Music or Wondery app. From Wondery, I'm Matt Ford. And I'm Alice Levine. And this is British Scandal. So, Alice, last episode, we dived headfirst into the world of the Rolling Stones. As we've seen with other bands, they can contain very tricky dynamics. So what do you make of the relationship between Brian Jones and the rest of them? 
So obviously big bands attract big characters, which is probably where the difficulty starts. Brian, obviously really talented. He came up with the idea for the band in the first place, the band name. He's sort of the main driving force in the early days. But clearly there's just something in the alchemy that means he butts heads with Keith Richards. It's sort of a battle for the soul of the band. Classic blues or popular rock and roll. And when you put it into perspective, like you did in the last episode, we're 18 months in. And it's already feeling like it's going in the wrong direction. The growing resentment is palpable. Yeah, you can understand where these resentments come from. They meet so young, they start with no idea of where this is going to lead them. But Brian doesn't help himself, does he? Five pounds more than the rest of the band, not writing any of the songs. There's sort of just a distinct lack of thinking of one another and thinking like a unit. Yes, and there's one more cliche I think we're missing. Fighting over a girl? Yep. (laughs) I was actually joking. Why are men so predictable? Strap in. This is episode two, Love and Other Drugs. Four years earlier, May 1965. Chess Records, South Michigan Avenue, Chicago. (coughs) Keith grimaces and puts down his guitar as Brian launches into another coughing fit. (coughs) Keith's almost convinced he's doing it on purpose now. The band have booked a session at the iconic Chess Records Studios. Keith can't believe they're standing in the foam-clad room, walking the glossy black floors where Chicago Blues was born. Gold records and posters of Bo Diddley, Little Walter and Keith's beloved Chuck Berry line the walls. But the Stones are barely able to get through a take without Brian's lungs giving way. It could be hay fever season. Just get some fexafenadine. Would it kill you to take a beckonase? Keith looks at him now, puffing uselessly into his brass harmonica. His skin looks almost grey. Brian suffers a lot with his asthma, and this seems to be a particularly bad attack. (coughs) I I think I should um, (coughs) go to hospital. Their manager, Andrew Oldham, shakes his head furiously. You're joking, right? Brian, we're playing the Airy Crown Theatre in an hour. But Keith can't be bothered to put up with Brian's pathetic rasps any longer. Go. I'll cover for him. It's no bother. Brian eyes him suspiciously before stumbling meekly out of the studio without so much as a thank you. Keith snorts derisively, sticking two fingers up to the closing door. Things between the two of them are worse than ever. That's apparent to an outsider. Brian's arrogance and constant need to assert himself grinds Keith's gears. So he and Mick have taken it upon themselves to bring him down a peg or two. They ridicule his short neck and constantly nick the cushion he needs to see over the steering wheel of his new car. I'm sorry, but come on, that's low-hanging fruit. It's essentially chopped up and in a bowl for you. As the band pile into a black limousine, Keith hurriedly runs through every song on his guitar. He's just about covered the set list when Mick punches him hard in the shoulder. Here, isn't that Brian? Keith puts down the guitar and cranes his neck out of the window to see Brian, changed into a suit with a stupid little bow around his neck, being driven in a red open-top Mustang. Ho, 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 busted! He looks significantly healthier than he did before. (laughs) His arms wrapped around two model types in paisley shift dresses with immaculate blonde beehives. And in the front passenger seat, Keith can't believe it, It's Bob Dylan. Amazingly played. He gives a bad name to asthmatics. Oscar-worthy performance. That wheeze. Every time I have a wheeze now, you're going to think I'm running off with Bob Dylan. (laughs) You've got two beauties waiting outside in little mini dresses. The little bastard. Keith's fists clench. This is unbelievable. Brian's blown off their gig, left them all in the lurch, made out he was at death's bleeding door. Also, he could go and schmooze a load of celebrities. An hour later, the slim down stones walk out onto the enormous stage at the Airy Crown Theatre. Keith looks out over the massive auditorium. The rows of seats go on forever. He doesn't usually get nervous, but tonight he feels dizzy, anxious, like the weight of the gig is on his shoulders. But the minute he strums the intro to satisfaction, it's like the music possesses him. He's playing out of his skin, leaping lithely about the stage, hitting every note with exquisite precision. The audience go berserk. 
an army of security guards start dragging female fans off the stage. By the time he gets to the end of the song, his snakeskin print shirt soaked with sweat and the skin on his fingers is red raw. As he basks in the rapturous applause, Keith grins and wipes his forehead. Maybe they don't need Brian at all. Fourteenth of September, nineteen sixty-five, Circus Krona Building, Munich. Anita Pallenberg slinks into the back of the giant garish circus tent and lights a cigarette. I know we've been doing this a long time now, but I get excited when it's a well-known person. Anita Pallenberg, sixties actress, model, I think, definitely major muse. She ruffles her blunt blonde fringe, watching in bemusement as hysterical girls clamber onto speakers. Their hands grasping at the band's trouser legs. Anita's used to hanging out with the Dolce Vita crowd in Rome, and in Andy Warhol's factory in New York. But while she's in Munich for a modelling gig, she's excited to discover a new scene. She's been told amazing things about the Rolling Stones, the wild rock and roll band from England, who've left the Beatles for dead with their tongue-in-cheek lyrics and rough Chicago sound. She's hoping for a fun night. But Anita folds her arms as the lead singer, in garish striped trousers, prances about the stage, opening and closing his mouth like a fish. Well, if you don't like that, I'm sorry. There's much more where that came from. Next to him, a thin-faced guitarist with oily black hair and overcrowded teeth pulls faces and squares up to boys in the audience like he's spoiling for a fight. Anita can't help thinking they're thoroughly average, immature, like a bunch of schoolboys. But then Brian. Catches her eye. He's playing quietly in a striped T-shirt and waistcoat, a couple of paces back from the lead singer and guitarist, ignoring their bolshy showmanship. He gets out a marimba, sitar, and saxophone during their performance, plays each one impeccably, with a kind of intense concentration. Yes, she thinks, there's something intriguing about him. I've never seen a more textbook example of somebody trying to impress a girl. <laughs> It just pulls out marimba, sitar, saxophone, one after the other. What doing keepy uppies? <laughs> Afterwards, Anita slips backstage, not even bothering to look the security guards in the eye. The band are immediately fawning over her, gazing at her with bright, enthralled expressions on their faces. The guitarist Keith puts an arm around her. What are you doing after this? Anita shrugs. Are you boys in the mood for a party? She pulls out a little bottle and a small pouch from her bag, but there's an awkward, stammering silence. Keith takes a step back, looking nervous. It's just, we've got a bunch of interviews tomorrow. Anita sinks with disappointment. It's just poppers and hash. So much for a rock and roll night. But then Brian Jones eagerly takes the little brown bottle from her, inhales. And starts expertly rolling a joint, looking up at her with gentle eyes. He introduces himself in almost perfect German. Oh, he's a dark horse, isn't he, our Bry? And if you think I'm going to read that bit out, you've got another thing coming. Ich habe einen Bruder. My Lieblingsgeschäft ist Topshop, weil es toll ist. That's all I've got. What's that? My friend works in Topshop. I have a brother, and my favourite shop is Topshop because it's cool. My God. Now defunct, so it tells you when I learned that sentence. <laughs> He tells her he learnt German from his teenage years, bumming around Europe with his guitar. Yeah, same sort of. The corner of Anita's mouth breaks into a smile. She kneels down beside Brian as he smoothly takes her through his collection of instruments. He talks passionately about how much he hates the band's pop identity these days, vowing to return them to their roots, the blues. It's like his eyes are ablaze. Anita can't help but be enthralled. But then Keith cuts in, trying to share a conspiratorial glance with Anita. For the love of God, will you put a sock in it, Brian? Preferred it when you weren't here. Anita sees Brian's ears burn. She stands, turns to Keith. I preferred it when children were seen and not heard. All right, Anita. She holds out her hand for Brian to take. He grins at her, grabbing her hand and leading her from the room. A current of excitement runs through her. She knows they're going to have a good night. September 1965, Elm Park Mews, Chelsea, London. 
Brian sits cross-legged on the parquet floor of his new Muse flat, picking out notes on his saxophone and trying his hardest to concentrate. With the Stone's gruelling touring schedule, he hardly spends any time at the flat. The room is sparsely furnished, except for an orange sofa with a walnut wooden frame and several stands overflowing with records. That's a statement. A statement that says, I've got a terrible taste in sofas. The walls gleam with dazzling gold wallpaper, Brian's first purchase when he moved in. I wonder if he went to the same person as Boris did. His eyes keep being drawn from his sax to Anita, breezing about the room in lace lingerie and one of Brian's shirts. She's a goddess, he thinks. Beautiful, wild, intelligent. And out of all the stones, she chose him. She comes up behind him and wraps her arms around his neck. Join me, Brian. Looking up, he sees her eyes drift. Her pupils are black orbs. Anita's been trying to get Brian to try acid with her since that first night in Munich. But he's refused. He only takes drugs in very small, set quantities. He hates the idea of feeling out of control. It will help you be creative. I promise. But Brian shakes his head. Anita rolls her eyes. He goes back to his saxophone, but her voice stretches over the notes. Let's make something together. My new film, A Degree of Murder. I want you to do the music. Brian stops. Are you serious? Anita laughs, frolicking back toward him and falling into his lap. I told the director, you won't find a musical genius like Brian Jones. The job is yours. Brian's heart thumps. He's been feeling so flat, ignored and underappreciated with the stones. But now he has Anita. For the first time in a long time, Brian feels like someone truly believes in him. He kisses Anita hard. Laughing, she drags him up roughly by his collar and shoves him down on the sofa. He can see a thin tab, decorated with a peace symbol, glinting between her teeth. She leans forward flicks the tab with her tongue into his mouth. Brian closes his eyes and swallows. The next thing Brian knows, he's clambering into his shiny Humber Super Snipe car, Anita leaping into the passenger seat. The street lamps take off and fill the sky like spaceships. Brian drives slowly, craning his neck over the steering wheel. Stonehenge is calling to him. I'm not an expert in this department, having never taken acid and never driven a car. But is it wise to do both at the same time? It's a terrible idea, isn't it? I mean, I was quite a nervous driver. I don't think I'd even have a Coke Zero before driving. Are you serious? Yeah, I'm just like, I don't want, like, caffeine, because that'll affect my decision-making. So you think that you're under the influence if you have a Coke Zero? I just think just water, but not too much, because then what if you're in a traffic jam and you need the toilet? Just like, the whole thing's a nightmare. You certainly shouldn't do it on acid. <laughs> I'm imagining your other half being like, could you just drop me at the station? You're like, I haven't fasted for two days, which is when I'm at my prime for driving the car. But it is. I mean, driving even late at night. I just find it so stressful. <laughs> so sorry. You can't drive at night. You can't drive if you've had a drink of something like fizzy pop. So when can you drive? Around 11am, when everything's fully digested. <laughs> and the light is good. <laughs> the coarse wind rips through Stonehenge lifting Anita's flimsy baby doll nighty above her waist. In the moonless black, the stone slabs glow fluorescent with some sort of holy celestial energy. Brian leaps and races around, the cold hard earth scraping the soles of his bare feet. Whoops flood out of his mouth. He's never known joy like this. Complete, unadulterated freedom. A million different voices peel off the rocks. They tell him, the rest the of the rest band needs you. You do not you do need, not the, need the, band. the band. You're so You're much so further down the path of enlightenment than them. It is you, Brian, and Anita that will make something great. Now that is rock and roll. Suddenly, Brian sees it, clear as day. He and Anita are the elite, on a different level to the rest of them. Through the blackness, the universe expands infinitely out in front of them. He sweeps Anita up in his arms and kisses her. All he feels in this moment is complete and total undying love.
September 1966, Courtfield Road, London. Keith takes a step back as Brian swings open the door to his little muse flat with violent enthusiasm. The place is gaudy, Keith thinks, a melange of migraine-inducing acid patterns and fluorescent colours. There are few places Keith would like to be less than here. Brian so much as breathing rubs Keith up the wrong way, but newly single Keith hasn't got a lot of options. Mick is in a long-term relationship, and he doesn't really know what to do with himself. So Keith swaggers in past a glassy-eyed Brian and asks straight away, Where's Anita? Brian gestures vaguely before putting a newly rolled joint in his mouth, lighting it and handing it to Keith. Keith takes it, inhaling deeply, and sinks down onto the orange sofa. As Brian buzzes about the flat, refreshing drinks, he breaks out into little dances, impersonating Mick. Clearly, Brian thinks, with Mick loved up, this is his opportunity to bring Keith over to his side. Keith stifles a laugh. He's missed this side of Brian, the Brian he could actually have a laugh with back in their squat in Fulham. Most days now, they get the side that's whiny, anxious and paranoid. Finally, Anita swans into the room in a daisy-spangled mini-dress. What do you think of my dress, Keith? She stares at him pointedly, like she expects something from him. But truthfully, she looks good in anything. It's, uh, very nice. He's mortified to realise his cheeks feel hot. He hopes it doesn't show. Anita flings herself down dramatically on a yellow egg armchair opposite Keith. Some really very wild interior design choices going on here, even for the 60s. I'll have an unmatching two-piece. <laughs> I want an orange sofa and a big egg. What do you have in the yoke department? Nice? I hate that word, nice. Stop being so bourgeois. Keith can see Brian in his periphery, turning up records loud for Keith to listen to. What do you think of this one? The riff, in a minute. Listen. Shouting over the track, Keith asks, Couldn't go out and get me some fags, could you, Bri? Brian offers him his own pack, but Keith shakes his head. None of that shit. Benson and Hedges. Brian nods enthusiastically and heads for the door. A jolt of excitement runs through Keith as he realises they're alone. Anita walks over to him, snatches his joint and takes a long drag. Even the way she exhales is effortlessly cool. When she hands it back to him, his fingers tremble, just a little. As he takes a drag, his eyes meet hers. She smirks. For a minute, it's like there's an energy between them. And he's sure she feels it too. Uh-oh. But all too soon, Brian's traipsing back into the room with several packs of Benson and Hedges. I didn't know how many you wanted. Keith slides back in his seat, his heart pounding in his ears. He knows he can't act on his chemistry with Anita. His relationship with Brian is hanging by a thread. It would break up the band. But as he glances sideways at Anita's long legs, her mess of blonde hair, he knows this can only end badly. Since his death in 2009, the world has struggled with how Michael Jackson should be remembered, as the king of pop or as a monster. I'm Leon Nafok, the host of Fiasco and the co-creator of Slow Burn. And I'm Jay Smooth, a hip-hop journalist and cultural commentator. Michael Jackson was accused of child molestation for the first time in 1993. Our new podcast, Think Twice, Michael Jackson, is the story of what came before and what came after. Throughout the podcast, we explore what makes Michael Jackson seemingly uncancelable. And we dig into the complicated feelings so many of us have when we hear Billie Jean at the grocery store. Through dozens of original interviews with people who watched the story unfold firsthand, Think Twice is an attempt to reconcile our conflicted emotions about Michael Jackson, the man, with our deep-seated love of his art. Binge all 10 episodes of Think Twice, Michael Jackson on Wondery Plus in Apple Podcasts or the Wondery app. Eleventh of September, 1966. CBS TV studio, Broadway, New York. Andrew storms about a dingy producer's office under a flickering fluorescent light. He's got the phone perched between his shoulder and his ear, and he's scribbling details onto a notepad. 
The Stones are booked to perform on The Ed Sullivan Show tonight. It's one of the biggest entertainment shows in the US, but Andrew's down a guitarist. Again. Since meeting Anita, Brian's been even more unreliable. Turning up to rehearsals high or not turning up at all. A few weeks ago, Andrew had enough. He organised a car to bring Brian to the studios personally. But Brian was high on acid and became convinced that the studio door was riddled with black beetles. Oh, I hate it when that happens. And the last thing the Stones want to see is the Beatles. Very good, very good. Now he's gone and broken his wrist, punching a metal window frame during a drug-addled argument with Anita. Andrew has no choice but to find a temporary understudy. Finally, Andrew manages to pin down a decent guitarist, available for the show tonight and the Stones' upcoming tour dates. Relief washes over him. I'm afraid you'll have to travel separately to the rest of the band. The chap you're replacing has a rather jealous streak. Andrew hangs up the phone, pours himself a whiskey and collapses into the desk chair, wiping the sweat off his forehead with a handkerchief. Maybe it would be easier to replace Brian altogether. With minutes until showtime, Andrew leans with his arm against a camera stand. He watches makeup artists buzz about, sweeping powder over the band's cheeks. Suddenly, Brian bursts onto set in a pinstripe suit with his forearm in a cast. He points at the understudy guitarist. He can piss off! Andrew holds his hands up, trying to placate Brian. Come on now, Brian. This is as much for you as it is for us. To give you a chance to heal. As soon as you're as right as rain, I'm right as bloody rain now. Tell him to go. Andrew tries to smooth talk him, but Brian is resolute. I'm playing tonight. Crouching behind the camera as the director calls action, Andrew winces. Eyes fixed on the monitor like he's watching a car crash. This is going to be a disaster. But as the lights swing over to the Rolling Stones on stage, Brian, sat in the lotus position, opens Lady Jane with an exquisite instrumental on his dulcimer. Andrew can't help but be blown away. Behind him, the live studio audience ripples with stunned applause. Andrew decides that for now, cast or no cast, Brian has to stay in the banner. When he delivers, his skill is undeniable. Andrew just hopes he doesn't end up regretting that decision. January 1967, Blazers Nightclub, London. A News of the World reporter slumps down on a sticky red leather sofa in the VIP section, loosening his blue silk tie. The club is packed tonight. The heavy bass line makes his ears throb. Smoke stings his eyes and claws bitterly at the back of his throat. He sips a half pint of lager, hoping it'll revive him. But it only makes his eyes feel heavier. He had a tip-off that Twiggy would be here tonight, but she's a no-show. He starts downing the dregs of his drink, but then he becomes aware of the man now sitting opposite him. An elfin-looking blonde fellow in a pinstripe suit with a garish bow around his neck. He's got both his arms stretched the length of the sofa and is holding court for the rest of the group. An entourage of long-haired men in velvet jackets and sun-kissed models with long bare legs. Oh, the 60s. Loudly, the blonde fellow laments, Ridiculous! They should be listening to me. It's my band. I'm the leader of the Rolling Stones. The Stones? The reporter's trying to stop a triumphant grin from spreading across his face. The Rolling Stones are big news. His editor will be delighted if you can sort him an exclusive scoop. He leans forward. Here, uh, can I buy you lot drinks? Returning with a pricey round, the reporter hopes it'll be worth it. But the conversation slips into technical stuff about lyrics and chords, and he finds himself stifling a yawn. Until the blonde guy pulls out a small green and yellow box, takes out what looks like a white pill, and pops it into his mouth. Recreational drugs are big news these days. ITV recently put out a documentary showing the singer Donovan openly smoking weed. Now rumours are rife that huge stars, even the Beatles, could be using illicit substances. Rumours, rumours, rumours. That was Fleetwood Mac. 
But the pill's not enough on its own. This bloke could just have a headache. You, uh, got any hash? The blonde guy grins, like he's keen to impress. Bold as brass, he takes a tobacco tin out of his breast pocket. The reporter can't believe how openly he passes the tin around the group. The reporter grins and sinks the rest of his half pint, chest thumping. He's got him. A few hours later, he's at the News of the World headquarters, London. It's gone 3am, but the grey carpeted officers are fizzing with activity. Reporters with their shirt sleeves rolled up squint over their notebooks in the harsh fluorescent light and sip steaming mugs of strong coffee. The reporter's excitedly gabbling to his thick-set, ruddy-faced editor. A rolling stone, bold as brass, taking drugs in the middle of a nightclub! His editor runs a hand through his greasy hair, nodding. Very good. So which one was he? Ah. What? Which rolling stone? We can't exactly run it without a name. A good point. The reporter hesitates. Uh, he said he was the main one, the leader of the Rolling Stones. He's relieved to see his editor nod, thoughtfully. That'll be the front man then, Mac Jagger. The reporter grabs his notepad and furiously gets to work. Mick Jagger isn't going to come back from this. 11th of February 1967. News of the World Officers, London. The bleary-eyed editor of the News of the World hangs his head as his boss issues a lengthy bollocking. This is your mess, and I expect you to fix it. Heading back to his own office, the editor slumps down onto his desk chair, pouring himself a dram of scotch from the bottle in his desk drawer. He's in a heap of trouble, and he's got no idea how he's going to get out of it. Mick Jagger is suing the paper for libel after they mistook him for Brian Jones. And, with a strong alibi for the night in question, he looks set to win his case. The paper's only hope now is to turn up something that proves Mick Jagger is, in fact, a drug user. It's easy when looking back on the 60s to imagine that everybody everywhere was doing drugs and it was very run-of-the-mill and didn't send any ripples, really. But clearly this kind of hedonism, nihilism, that celebrities were living out, there was an appetite for that in the news. Yeah, think of Britain in the 1960s. It's easy to look back now and imagine that everyone was becoming really liberal. A small group of people were. The vast majority of people were horrified by stuff like this, but also delighted to read about it. And the news of the world's defining crusade of the time was celebrities doing drugs. That was like their main source of front pages. But today, the editor had to inform bosses they turned up nothing. He drains his drink and is pulling on a worn camel overcoat when the phone rings. The voice on the end of the line has a thick Belgian accent. I hear you're looking for information on the Rolling Stones. Because I know they're having a party, and I know there's going to be drugs. The editor drums his fingers impatiently on the desk. They've had plenty of tip-offs since the story broke. None of them have been the least bit true or useful. And who might you be? After a pause, the voice says... I am Patrick, the chauffeur for Mr. Keith Richards. An hour later, the editor is at the police headquarters near Victoria. They're having a party. Richards, Jagger, the lot of them. They've even got a dealer coming. Detective Sergeant Norman Pilcher is younger than he expected, early 30s maybe, with a broad nose and hair combed slickly into a middle parting. Apparently, he's a bit of a rising star, transferred from the flying squad to wage war on this new hippie drug culture and get high-profile users convicted. And you don't get much more high-profile than the Rolling Stones. The editor realises he's getting breathless as he excitedly relays every detail of his tip-off. It'll be at Redlands, Richard's country place. You have to get down there. The editor's relieved to see a smile crack across DS Pilcher's face. Don't you worry. We'll take care of it. As the editor walks out into the crisp night air, he feels a weight lift from his shoulders. They're about to bust the biggest band in England. 12th of February, 1967. Redlands, West Wittering, West Sussex. A weary quiet is beginning to fall over Redlands, 
as the post-acid come down settles in. As sunlight trickles through the thick navy curtains, half-naked partygoers turn away, burying their faces into Moroccan print cushions. Keith, however, is still fizzing with energy. He runs about the house, laughing his head off and telling jokes. Keith loves Redlands, a squat, thatched country house with timber framing and wisteria climbing up the brickwork. It's surrounded by lush green gardens and guarded by a little moat. It's his escape from the world, a sanctuary in which to let loose and have fun. From his bedroom window, Keith looks out to see hordes of little men in blue suits and helmets. They all look so serious, Keith can't help but burst out laughing. He runs down the stairs and throws open the door. Wonderful attire! Am I expecting you? Looking more than a little taken aback, a burly man with a broad nose and slick side parting, who seems to be their leader, begins reading from a piece of paper. My name is D.S. Pilcher. We have a warrant to... But Keith interrupts him, shivering slightly. Come on in and read it to me over the fireplace. After that, he practically forgets that the police are there. They bustle about, sifting through ashtrays, dragging open drawers and overturning mattresses, while Keith and his friends continue to nurse their comedowns. <coughs> Suddenly, there's a scream from upstairs. Mick's girlfriend, Marianne Faithful, has emerged from the bath draped only in a rabbit pelt rug. And now, the police are demanding to search her. D.S. Pilcher turns to a female officer wearing a knee-length A-line skirt. Take her upstairs and make her drop the rug. This is such an iconic moment. This has been raked over for decades since. It's been reappraised also for decades since. But I can't really think of a more defining image from the rock and roll era. Yes, and it's a distressing one for Marianne Faithful because the News of the World published a version of this event that is completely fictitious. That not only were Marianne Faithful and Mick Jagger involved in the sex act, but that it also involved a Mars bar. And that extra detail, fabricated, was just a way of making these people sound completely debauched and unusual. And she's used the word demonised latterly. That sexual shame only attached itself to women, and still does, really. For Mick Jagger, it just bolstered his rock and roll hero persona. It didn't really touch the sides, did it? As a helpless, terrified Marianne is muscled upstairs, Keith feels himself starting to sober up sharpish. These policemen aren't messing around. Suddenly, Pilcher is marching across the living room towards Keith, wearing a victorious smirk, and announces that they've found heroin belonging to a friend of Keith's and a small amount of speed. Who does this belong to? Keith thinks they're Marianne's. But Mick jumps in quickly. Mine! It's mine! Pilcher whirls back round to Keith with an austere expression on his face. You're in a lot of trouble, sir. Keith's chest starts working overtime. How did you know we was here? Who tipped you off? But deep down, Keith already knows. It's that bloody newspaper, trying to wreck Mick's libel case. All because Brian couldn't keep his stupid trap shut in the middle of a club. The next morning, Keith wakes up to an official-looking letter, with a Her Majesty's Government letterhead. He's being summoned to court. This is fucking serious. It could mean cancelled gigs, lengthy court cases. Worst case scenario, he's facing prison. And it's all because of one person. Brian. There's only one thing for it, he thinks. The Stones have to get out of here. February 1967, Paris, France. Brian waits for a gap in the bustling Parisian traffic, looking over his shoulder for paparazzi, and opens the door of Keith's shimmering dark blue Bentley for Anita. She ignores him, going the long way round the car. Brian peers into the Bentley, watches as Keith sidles into the middle seat to make space for Anita. Brian bristles. Anita's clearly still mad at him, spoiling after last night's fight. The Stones are fleeing to Morocco. The last few days have been a whirlwind. The minute the news broke in the papers, 
they knew they had to get as far away from England as possible. They also knew they wanted to be somewhere where gear was legal. Sure. Brian's been to Morocco once before, on the trip with Anita that resulted in his broken hand. He fell in love with the country, but the journey's going to take several days, and as the petrol-choked Paris streets give way to winding country roads, the atmosphere in the car is unbearably strained. Are they going to go the whole journey, just the three of them in the back like kids? So does the chauffeur just lean back and use his hand to whack them on the legs if they're being naughty? I told you, no drugs till we get there. Let your sister have Let your sister have some. Things between Brian and Anita are less than civil. She's acting kind of detached from him at the moment, distant. Sometimes he feels her tense when he touches her. At parties, he's convinced her eyes dart towards other men across the room. When he's confronted her, vicious rows explode and the pair of them end up riddled with bruises. Last night was one of those. Meanwhile, Keith has barely said two words to Brian since they left London. The news of the world debacle, the raid, the whole thing. Keith still thinks it's his fault. Brian chews his fingernails. His chest feels tight. He has to take the edge off this feeling of unease. So he reaches underneath his white leather seat and opens the secret drug compartment in the footwell. Very smart. Is that a feature on all Bentleys? Well, that's why they call it a gearbox. Oh! <laughs> Breath taken. Breath officially taken. He pulls out a tin of hash and starts rolling himself a joint. As the car begins to climb steadily up into the jagged, snow-capped Alps, Brian rolls another joint. His third or fourth, he can't remember. But the air's starting to feel thinner now. Brian's head begins to spin. He's taking huge gasps of air, but nothing seems to fill his lungs. He takes a puff on his inhaler, then another, but nothing relieves the tightness in his chest. I... I can't breathe. Then why the fuck are you smoking? Brian stays mute. His chest continues to rattle. Anita looks at him, concerned. For goodness sake, you're white, Brian. Brian's eyes feel heavy. Every time he opens them, the song on the radio has skipped forward a few seconds. He hears Anita hiss to Keith. I think he needs a hospital. Brian tries to protest that he's fine, but no sound comes out. Sweat begins to drip from his forehead and he starts to shiver. Suddenly, Keith and the driver are gripping his arms and bundling him out of the car towards a hospital. They reach the sterile white reception, but Anita hangs back. I will go with Keith. Rest. You can meet us in Morocco. What? Brian can't believe what he's hearing. He's sick. She can't just leave him here alone. How could she be so cold? Convinced he can't trust her, he grabs hold of Keith's sallow cheeks and pressing his face close to his. He wheezes desperately. Don't let Anita out of your sight. Keith nods. Don't worry, Brian. I'll look after her. February 1967, Spain. As the dark blue Bentley leaves Barcelona and slinks along the white sandy Costa Brava, Keith can't bring himself to look at Anita. But now, sitting next to her on the back seat, he can hear her breathing, smell the strong, musky scent of her perfume. He never makes a move on a girl, he silently reminds himself. In truth, he never has to. They always come to him eventually. And he's certainly not about to start now with his bandmate's girlfriend, even if Brian is an arsehole. For somebody who's very certain that something's not going to happen, there's a lot of thinking going into this. As the uneven terracotta grooves of Valencia begin to crest the horizon, Keith feels her shift across the seat a little towards him. Then a little more. Keith stares hard out of the window at the dry scrubs of straw in the fields the smooth curves of the hills, but you can feel her little finger brushing his. What? Okay, tell me more. He snatches away at first, does the right thing, but then a deep longing swells in his chest. Finally, he turns to look at her, bare knees crossed, blonde hair tucked behind her ears, eyes sparkling. She looks back at him, poised. Both of them wait for something to happen. 
Then, under her breath, he hears her murmur in her thick German accent. Fuck it. The next thing Keith knows, Anita's going down on him. Oh, is this our first scandal wrote a porno? <laughs> it does feel like that, doesn't it? We've never... I don't think we've ever gone into details of sex scenes before. Okay. You ready? Sort of. This does feel a bit like watching a nature documentary with your parents where the animals have it off. <laughs> I'm just not going to look at you. As he rests his head back, his pleasure gives way to something else. Something deeper. Pure, unadulterated happiness. In that moment, he sees it as clear as day. This isn't just some messed up fantasy. He's falling in love with this girl. Okay, all I'm going to say is, in that moment, you're going to feel some feels, okay? You're going to think some thinks. But just wait a beat before you make any decisions, yeah? But it doesn't take long for the relief to give way to an aching kind of guilt. There it is. Anita grips the sides of his face, looking deep into his eyes. If you'll keep it as our secret. Keith nods. He knows she's right. If Brian finds this out, the stones are done for. But deep down, he knows his feelings are strong. And he's not sure he'll be able to resist. February 1967, Toulouse, France. Under the harsh white lights of Brian's hotel room, Anita helps Brian out of his silk blue pyjamas. She goes to put a polo neck over his head, but he snatches it off her. What did you do? Anita busies herself with folding the pyjamas. Well, Valencia was lovely. But Brian sees her shoulders tense. Her eyes flick away from him. Something happened. Whilst he was shivering and delirious with pneumonia, perilously perched between life and death, Anita, his Anita, slept with someone else. Who is he? He tries to rail at her, but he's still weak and pallid, and the accusation comes out as a whimper. You're not making any sense, Brian. Here. She takes a tab of acid out of her embroidered purse. It'll pep you up. Brian swallows it down, but it does nothing to quench his jealous fire. Despite Anita's desperate pleas, he stumbles out of the hotel room and onto the terracotta streets of Toulouse. Acid addled and weak, he presses his body against walls to keep himself upright. He stares hard at every man he sees, pictures Anita naked on top of them. Everybody's looking at him, like he's the only one who doesn't know the truth. Fury pouring out of him now, he flings open the door of a brothel on one of the side streets and marches two of the girls back to the hotel. When they get up to the room, Anita is stretched out on the bed reading a book. He shoves the girls towards her. Fuck them. I'll watch. Anita looks at him, wide-eyed. No, Brian. Brian explodes. Then tell me who you fucked. Anita reddens. I've told you. Nothing happened. Flying into a rage, Brian screams at her. Then fuck them. Go on, for me. If you love me. Anita goes to leave. The two sex workers cower in a corner as Brian races for the door and pushes his weight against it. Anita shrieks. Get out of my way! Brian goes to slap her, but she's strong. She twists his arm around him and wrestles him to the floor, kicking him hard in the side. Brian lies there, all the wind knocked out of him, a searing pain in his ribs. He starts crying, pleading with Anita. Just tell me, Anita. Put me out of my misery. Anita collapses on top of him. He sees tears rolling down her cheeks. And in one moment, she brings Brian's whole world crashing down around him. I'm so sorry, Brian. You're right. I... It was Keith. Hello, Prime members. You can listen to British Scandal ad-free on Amazon Music. Download the Amazon Music app today. Or you can listen ad-free with Wondery Plus in Apple Podcasts. Before you go, tell us about yourself by completing a short survey at wondery.com slash survey. This is the second episode in our series, Death of a Rolling Stone. 
A quick note about our dialogue, in most cases we can't know exactly what was said, but all our dramatisations are based on historical research. If you'd like to know more about this story, you can read Brian Jones, The Untold Life and Mysterious Death of a Rock Legend by Laura Jackson, Life by Keith Richards, and you can watch Rolling Stone, Life and Death of Brian Jones on Amazon Prime and The Stones and Brian Jones on BBC iPlayer. I'm Alice Levine. And I'm Matt Ford. Lydia Marchant wrote this episode. Additional writing by Alice Levine and Matt Ford. Sound design by Rich Evans. Script editing by James Magniak. British Scandal is produced by Samizdat Audio. Our associate producer is Francesca Gilardi Quadrio Corsia. Our producer is Millie Chu. Our senior producer is Joe Sykes. Our executive producers are Theodora Leloudis, Stephanie Jens and Marshall Louis for Wondering. Wondering.